So I want to introduce David Prince, who's, uh, well, it says that you're a Microsoft account executive, so you can explain <laughs> a bit more about that. But you're going to give us much more um, information, aren't you, around uh, um, accessibility. And that's it. Perfect. Thank you. Good morning, everybody. Uh, my name's David Prince. Um, I work for Microsoft, but before that, I'm actually the father to Holly and Lily. Um, for those who can't see on the screen, there's a picture of myself and Holly. Uh, I'm a 50-year-old tall male, slightly overweight, which I've just heard, uh, with dark hair, and Holly is my daughter, um, who's now 16. Um, Holly can't be with us today. She would love to be, but actually she's doing a dressage competition tomorrow. And she said to me, look, I'm practicing for that, Dad. I love horses. That's the end of it. So she did leave me a little message, which I'm going to play, just so you can see her. But what I'd like to talk about today is really about how technology can be an enabler and how everybody can do everything they want to if they want to give it a try. So I'll let Holly talk for herself. Holly Prince, oh. I was diagnosed with Bardot Down syndrome at age 10. I'm sorry I can't be with you all today. As you can see, I am busy training for my dressage test, which is tomorrow. And my piece of advice is never give up. Come on, Betty Boo. So there was Holly, for those who can't see, on a horse called Betty Boo riding around a uh, riding ring, practicing for a course tomorrow. Um, so look, I work for Microsoft. I'm blessed that we are a technology company and we do a lot of exciting stuff to help people. Um, and one of the things that we do focus on as an organization is accessibility. Um, but the question is, in some ways, is what is accessibility? Now, I'd argue there's no such thing as disability. And we often say it's not a person who's disabled, it's the environment that's around them that's disabling. Because we all know that actually if we had access to all of the accessibility capabilities we see in the modern world, that most people can do anything. Uh, so when people say, you know, what is accessibility, then I say really it's an enabler. And it's a levelling of the playing field that enables everybody to do their best work whenever they want. Um, well, you know, when we look at accessibility and you know, why should we care, then, believe it or not, there's over one billion people in the world that have accessibility needs. And we talk about permanent disabilities, uh, and that could be potentially blindness or death. But we also talk about temporary disabilities, and that could be anything from somebody breaking an arm, um, hurting themselves, even having a baby in an arm and having to do something. And then we talk about situational, again, disability, which could be that baby, or it could be just a case of you're somewhere where you find something difficult. So why do we care? Um, as an organisation, you know, Microsoft and a lot of corporates out there recognise that actually diversity and inclusion is the key to success. You know, and that's why you see large organisations such as Microsoft, Google, Apple, putting so much money and time into accessibility because actually it makes the world a richer place. So my takeaway from that is, you know, I say to Holly, be proud about who you are. You know, it is who you are. You know. Do not worry about what other people think because you bring different things to the table that other people cannot. She has a different perspective on the world which is of value to people and actually can actually help other people. In a role I find her a much more compassionate person when she's talking to people and she listens more than other people. So my point to you is, is be proud of yourselves and look inside yourselves because everybody has a set of special skills that they can bring to the table. Now we also see you know, a lot of people talking about woke in the modern world. And I would say that woke is a good thing because actually the kids that I speak to that people refer to as woke are far more inclusive and far more aware of people and how to make them feel comfortable. And we see that now in a lot of mainstream TV programmes. And for those who can't see the slide, I've got some pictures of some of the people that you see on TV today. We've got Rose Ailing Ellis, who won the Strictly Come Dancing uh, competition, which was on TV recently through people like Lucy Edwards, who's an influencer that is blind, that I've got a video a bit later on in. And we see a lot more of this on TV. And I think it's a good thing, because no longer is it seen as a disability, it's simply seen as normality. Uh, and I just want to say that, you know, I see a big sea change out there. I think for any parents that talk about their children and what they're facing for any young adults or adults in the audience, then hopefully you're seeing this as well. And I think... You know, we are seeing things improve, and I think from a technology perspective, and I'll come on to this a bit further in the presentation, we're seeing some mass, massive advancements. And I think you'll start to see that permeate through everything from things like TV, radio, buildings, work, and even your home life. So how does Microsoft do this? You, know, you might think that, you know, how do companies come up with these great ideas? Um, you know, 
we think about it in, I guess, six major areas for Microsoft. We think about vision, we think about hearing, we think about neurodiversity, we think about learning, mobility, and mental health. I'm going to just touch on one of those today, which is primarily vision, because I recognise a lot of people in the audience today potentially are partly sighted or blind. But again, I also see for my daughter, neurodiversity and dyslexia, and for myself and dyslexia, is a big area. So I'm going to run a session after this. If anybody wants to come and talk to me about the type of things that we have within our technologies, potentially can help you or your children or you and your roles in Bioways, come and see me. So within Microsoft, um, we use Windows PCs. And for anybody who has a Windows PC, on the keyboard, there's a little Windows emblem that you can click on. If you press that Windows emblem down and the letter U, up pop a set of accessibility settings. And for those who can't see the slide, it's a screen print of my PC when I press the accessibility settings. And in there, we've tried to group these accessibility settings into different areas. So the first set you see when you press Windows and U relate to vision. And if I talk about some of my favourite ones in there, which are the most useful for my daughter Holly, the first one is text size. So we all know with visual impairment, you can't always see that tiny black writing on a little page. You can actually make the text size on your computer larger and on your documents. And you simply slide it to the right, and it makes things bigger. If you want to make things smaller, slide it to the left, and it's very easy to do. Um, now, that's useful. But also, the other thing we see within computers is there's a little pointer, which is called a mouse, that you use to move around. And whoever thought that up had a very sick sense of humour because it's a tiny little pointer, which is normally kind of like black and white on a white page. It's very hard for people to see with visual impairment. You can actually make that pointer much larger and you can change the colour. Again, it's under the accessibility mouse and pointers. If I was presenting with my PC today, you'd see that I've got a giant pink pointer you can use, and people cannot miss it. Whenever I talk to people, they go, oh, look at the size of that. I'm like, yes, that's my pointer. <laughs> <And> I, <laughs> it's true, so if you've never tried it, try it, it will change your life. And it's amazing when you give presentations, because people can actually see what you're pointing at. But again, if you do have sight impairment, it is a really easy way of doing things. The other thing to call out to you is called a text cursor. And whenever you go on, log on to a computer or do an email, there's a little blinking symbol that you will have on the screen for someone with visual impairment. Again, impossible to see, because it's so small, and it's kind of white on a black background, or black on a white background. You can actually make it really big. And that's massively helpful for when you're trying to find out where you are on a particular page. So if you want to see it a bit later, come and see me, and I'll show you how to do it, and we can have a go at it ourselves. And of course, there's magnifier. Um, for anybody using a PC, it's one of the simplest ways to actually zoom in and see something on your screen that should help you when you're trying to see something or show people. Again, really useful when you're trying to do presentations. For anybody that doesn't have a disability or sight impairment, you can zoom in to a particular point on the screen. Happy to show you when you come and see me. Uh, and there's another one, again, called uh, Contrast. I don't know if everybody uses this today, but you can actually change your screen from looking like it's white to looking like it's black with right writing on, which makes it far easier to read. Some of you may be using it on your phones today, but equally it's easy to do on a PC. My daughter Holly does that, and that's how she sees her screen. I have it the other way around. And we can also change it for different colours depending on different applications you're using. So don't think you're stuck with the settings that your PC comes up with. The last one, which I think is really useful, is called Narrator. And the question is, is you know, if you have tired eyes because you have visual impairment, or just you've done a long day in the office doing your reports, whatever it is, if you want to read a page, you do not have to read it by using your eyes. You can use narrator to read to you what's on the page or what the function is that you're doing with the PC. Fairly easy to turn on, and for anybody that's looking to go to school or to college or at work, it's an amazing feature that opens up the use of a computer to you. Um, there are other softwares out there, there are things like Narrator, which is called JAWS, and there's others. But this is built into your PC if you ever get stuck and want to use something. The last couple of areas called out to you is two functions that Holly finds really useful. The one is Dictate. Now, Holly has learned touch typing with her PC over the last few years because I was a big advocate for having a PC at home for her to do her work on. But the challenge she sometimes has is being able to type as quickly as she wants to because she's a touch typist. Now you can actually dictate emails, you can actually dictate Word documents, you can actually dictate pretty much anything. You can even control your PC by using your voice. So we've got the ability, to, for instance, to tell the PC to wake up, you can ask it to open Word, 
you can ask it to close Word, you can dictate emails. So don't just think you have to be an amazing typist if you're using a PC or using a Word document or you're trying to do your homework or your work. You can actually do that. The reverse of that, when you dictate, is something called immersive reader, where you can actually hear back what you've said. Now, I personally find that really useful because I have dyslexia, and if I type an email to somebody, I can't see the mistakes I make. It's just terrible. But when I listen back to what I've written, it's far easier to pick out the grammatical or mistakes that I've made, and it's something I'd encourage everybody in the room to try. If you're writing an important email to somebody, click on um, immersive reader and just listen to what you've typed, and it will help you understand whether it sounds correct and if you want to make any amendments to it. Um, now, what Microsoft is also trying to do is to drive up accessibility through its documents and things that people use. We have a technology called Accessibility Checker. And if you build a presentation, you can actually click on Accessibility Checker, and it will spot any issues that you may have made from an accessibility standpoint. Now, Classic, which I guess anybody with blindness or vision impairment would have, is something called Alt Text. Because I'm going through slides on a page today, but if I send this presentation, you wouldn't be able to see what's on there. You couldn't see the slide, you wouldn't be able to see the picture, but alt text is where somebody puts a description of what the picture is into the diagram. Now, because we can use now artificial intelligence, it takes some of the leg way away, because if I did a picture of a cat, artificial intelligence would know it's a cat and would suggest it's a picture of a cat, I just have to accept it. If it's something different, it doesn't recognize, you can simply add your own alt text. So my encouragement to anybody in the room that works in or goes to the office or does anything that they send somebody, just try clicking on the accessibility checker and see how accessible is the document you're sending to somebody. And it will naturally give you tips and tricks on how to improve that document for others. Again, very happy to show people uh, when we get to the end. I'm sorry I'm going a bit fast, but I do also recognize I'm between you and lunch. I don't want to get these little things thrown at me. Um, I'll flip past this. Now, as I say, how does Microsoft go about doing this? You know, we have some very clever people but we also live our technology within Microsoft. So we have an accessibility lab that we've built in the US. I'm not gonna go through the video just for time, but we actually have people that have a lived experience. And we have a lab that's built that actually helps people understand how do people use technology and how do people wanna use technology and then how do we build that into our technology. The other thing we do as a company is we do things called hacks, where we come together as a global community and we talk about big subjects that we can look at and how can we solve problems? Um, but the most important thing for us is actually, believe it or not, feedback from people that use technology. Now, we have a free telephone support service called the Disability Answer Desk that anybody with a disability or anybody that's looking after someone with a disability can phone and ask for help. And that relates to a technology that works with Microsoft. So if you've installed Windows 11 or you've got Outlook, or even if you want to put something on our technology like JAWS on top of Windows 11 and you can't do it, Ring Microsoft. We will take as long as it needs to help you with the problem you're trying to solve or give you advice and guidance. And you will talk to people that have a lived experience in your disability area or have been trained in that area, and we can help you. And we capture that feedback and those asks, and we actually use them to develop our products on the next iteration. So in some ways, it's a virtuous circle of how we can help people and the information we get from yourselves. I'm happy to share the telephone numbers on the screen there. Which, but again, I can send this to anybody afterwards. But any parent that gets stuck or anybody needs any help, just, just ring us, it's my ask to you. Um, now, to talk about the big opportunity when it comes to technology is artificial intelligence. And probably everybody's seen a bit on the press recently about artificial intelligence and something called large language models, which is just like a giant brain in some ways. Now, half of the people in the planet the artificial intelligence is going to come along and kill us. And there's a picture of a supervillain on the screen called uh, Ultron from the Avengers. And on the right of that, which people won't, might not know, because my daughters were showing them, didn't know who it was, is a character from Star Trek, showing my age, called Data. And he's like a nice computer. He looks like a man, has a cat, and he's a friendly kind of computer. But where do I think the world going? Well, I actually think the world is going to become a lot better because of artificial intelligence to help people. And we look at things such as image recognition, and I'll show you about that in a second. We talk about speech recognition, which again, from anybody with a visual impairment, is going to be massively beneficial to you for moving forward if you can actually ask a computer to do something for you. Um, we also have the capability now to do if you like, an understanding of things and you can, for instance, you can create a PowerPoint presentation very soon by just asking it to do it for you. And if you want to add 
animations to a PowerPoint and make things move, you can just ask it. So the fact that artificial intelligence is coming, I believe for the disability community will be a massive enabler. And the last thing is to talk about natural language. All natural languages, when you hear about large language models, is the fact a computer can understand a question and come back with the right, correct answer to you. So you could say to it, what's the most successful football team in the uh, English league? And it would come back to you and say Liverpool. And, I, and you can even then say, <laughs> not for me, but you could even then say, what's my favourite team? And it would know you. And it's because it has a large amount of computing power behind it. Now, just to give you an example, for those who don't know, Microsoft has an application that's available for the iPhone called Seeing AI. Um, I think it's an incredible application. It was developed by a developer for Microsoft who is blind. And when you hear from him and he talks about he, how he develops, he develops a keyboard without a PC screen. So he's doing this purely from a thought process and purely how you do things. Now, this application could do a number of things for you. So, for instance, it can recognize... Short text. An introduction to Bardet Beagle Syndrome. BBS. Bardet Beagle Syndrome. All I did syndrome. there is a whole BBS application. is a rare genetic currency. <laughs> 20 pounds. See, it uses 20 pounds. Now, it could even do, if I can borrow... This is cool. One face, zero, one, four, five faces. Processing. Four people detected 49-year-old man with grey hair and a beard looking... <laughs> now, so, so that's, that's an application you can download for your iPhone, OK? Now, if you're visually impaired, it can tell short text, which simply hold it over a document. So when Holly gets a birthday card, she can hold it over a letter and it can read out to Holly Prince at our address. And she can open the card and she can actually have the phone read the message to her. It can recognise handwriting. It can recognise bigger forms. And if I held it over that form or a menu, it's a not visible top left. So if you're blind, you can move it a bit to the right. And in essence, it would read the menu too if it was a menu we're looking at. It can recognise faces and you can input the face to it. So for Holly, it would say Daddy or Mummy or Lily, but if you're in a meeting and you're blind, you want to hold up to who's in the meeting with you and what their expressions are, because that's something you can't always tell. Again, artificial intelligence can do that for you. It can do scenes, so I could literally say to it, if you want to know what the scene would be, say, say you're on holiday and you want to know what the scene is. Zero so if I go, face scene, preview, processing, a group of people sitting in chairs in a room. Not bad, not bad. So it can do that, it can do colours. Um, and it's an incredible app, and it's an enabler for people using artificial intelligence. Now, it's been taken a step further than that because of this large language model capability that's just been released from a company called um, OpenAI. Now, that capability, which I'll be showing, um, is using the picture and the artificial intelligence to know what something is, but then you can ask it a question like, OK, in my fridge I've got X, what can I make with that? And I'm going to show you an application from a company called Be My Eyes. For those, again, who haven't heard of Be My Eyes, they're a charity that has um, both sighted volunteers, so I am, I think it's about six million sighted volunteers, there's about 500,000 visually impaired or blind people. And the way it works is, if you need to know something, or you're somewhere where you don't need to go, or you want to find something out, you press the button, it phones someone who's a volunteer. And you have to be quick to answer, because the point is they want quick responses. And because there is such a disparity, you might have it on your phone for some time, and when you get the call, it's always when you're not available. But it does work, and it has to help people. And you can ring someone and say, look, I'm in an airport, do I go left or right? Or the person who phoned me says, I'm at a photocopier, have I pressed 9 or have I pressed 99? I said, oh, you've pressed 9. It's said, great, thanks, bye. It was gone. Uh, so if you haven't seen BMO Eyes, download it. And they've taken our Seeing AI application, and they've enhanced it with a large language model, I'm just going to show you what it can do, and this is the lady that uh, you saw earlier in the presentation using it as an application. It should be self-explanatory, but I'll just cover it off at the end if not. Artificial intelligence is set to take a mobile phone app that helps blind and partially sighted people to the next level. It'll speed up the way the app helps in many of the everyday decision-making processes, which sighted people take for granted. At the age of 17, Lucy Edwards lost her sight altogether. 
Now a bit of tech is helping her picture Voice memos. what she can't see. Open be my eyes. Take picture. Lucy is one of the first Cancel. in the world to trial an artificial intelligence powered app. What's in the fridge? Question mark. To not only describe the world around her, just eggs, milk, cheese, but to contextualize it too. What can I make with these ingredients? Question mark. Virtual volunteer. There are many dishes you could make with those ingredients, such as an omelette, scrambled eggs, or grilled cheese. That's so cool. The app uses ChatGPT, an AI powered tool which this week was updated to be able to interpret pictures as well as words. Based on the picture, it seems like the milk expires on the 21st of December, Yay! 2023. It's really good just to, yeah, make sure I know that I'm not going to kill myself or anyone else around us by eating multi food. <laughs> Does it always get it right? Yeah, I would say 95% of the time. What are the models wearing in the photo? The models are wearing various outfits from the Chanel Spring slash Summer 2003 ready to wear collection. This app makes me cry. I took a photo of a tube map and it told me where to go. I had not been confident on the tube for 10 years and it's doing that. So just, I can't wait for what it else it can do. So as you saw there, what we had is artificial intelligence taking a picture, but because you then have it paired with something called a large language model, you can tell you how to do something. And to Lucy's point, I could take a picture, let's say, of Waterloo Station, say, how do I get to St Pancras? And because it understands what's in, if you like, a large library, it can say, OK, take this route, do this, do that. And this is what's coming through to technology that you will have in your hands to help you in your everyday lives moving forward. And I've been giving my five-minute warning, so just the things to call out <laughs> is, and I'll show you this later, is Microsoft has an accessibility site we can go to where we talk about all the features that are available that you can use on your PC broken into those different areas I talked about at the start. We have a disability answer desk that you can phone for free support. I'd suggest using it, give it a try, see what you think it helps us to help you. Um, we've also got a YouTube site, which you might not know about, called Microsoft Enable. With loads of how-to videos, loads of people giving examples of what to do, some really great stuff on there that you can use. Um, we've actually got, for businesses and for people at home, if you want to do some training about accessibility, there's a free course you could do which is called an act, with an action badge about what is accessibility, how do you use our technologies, how do you do things. And again, we encourage organisations to make their employees aware so they can take it to the workplace. Um, this is a small video about it's not just work, it's also fun. Microsoft owns Xbox, for those who don't know. We have a big accessibility focus on Xbox you can also look at. Uh, the video here, which I'll be really quick on, is a guy who's blind playing Forza, which is a driving game. This is game. bringing the so, AAA racing genre to the blind community to the fullest. My name is Brandon Cole. I'm a professional accessibility consultant, uh, specifically a totally blind accessibility consultant. With our blind driving assists, we wanted to make this the most accessible Forza yet. I'm not going to play any more of that video, but just play Xbox Online and drive. Do not get in your mum and dad's car and drive, as I suggest. <laughs> <laughs> you can always give it a go, I think. You can try that you like. Um, things that I've learned along the way is you're not alone. And that's the thing I would say. And there is tons of help out there, which I think you've heard today. Use BBS, use RNIB, talk to people like Microsoft. There are obviously Google, Apple, other people out there you can leverage for accessibility stuff. Something I found useful as a learning is um, we bought Holly a PC because the school PC was rubbish and old and terrible. But we went for a 15 inch screen TV uh, PC because obviously the wider the screen, the easier it is for people to pan in and out on a touch screen to see things. And if you want bigger font size and text, the bigger the screen, the better that you can use. So I'd suggest. If you're going to use a PC for home or work, at least go for a 15-inch device uh, and make sure it's touchscreen. Um, I would say push your school to use JAWS on a PC because that's a great skill to have for the future, but it isn't necessarily the only thing you can use because, as I said, there's a ton of Microsoft capabilities uh, there for you. And embrace, sorry, embrace voice technology, embrace your phone, fight the school. If they tell you you can't use the phone at school, tell them it's an accessible requirement that your daughter or son or you need to have and just use it because it will be in so invaluable in later life. The last thing I'll leave you with is not something from Microsoft, but it was a video that done, it's my favorite video when it comes to accessibility from the 2016 Olympics by Channel 4. And it's, it's a video about the run up to the Olympics and it's all about, yes, you can. And that's what I'm gonna leave you with. So I'm gonna play the video, it's got an audio description and then we'll finish up there. All right, folks, strap in. A drum fills the screen, but the drumsticks are in the feet of a man with no arms. A 10-piece swing band joins in. 
featuring a one-armed bass player and a blind pianist. A lead singer in a blue suit and trilby performs a spin in a wheelchair. Yes, I can suddenly. The lead yes, singer rolls off the stage and onto a road, racing alongside British Paralympian yes, Hannah Cockcroft. Take a look, what do you see? Then an athlete with one leg hops an impressive high jump. Got the feeling that Striking images of people doing things with their feet, from a mother lifting her baby to a man doing donuts in a car around the band. Yes, I can. A series of wheelchair users, from ballroom dancers to wheelchair rugby players who collide. Ouch! The singer rolls into a black and white scene, complete with graceful amputee tap dancers, a pianist with partially formed arms, tap dancing prosthetic legs, and a chorus line of girls elegantly displaying their stumps. The singer dons a crash helmet and smashes through the set wall. A starter's pistol, Paralympic swimmers racing, then Blade Runner Richard Whitehead sprinting on a track. A rock band appears in the middle of a wheelchair basketball game. A guitarist with one hand rocks out, while the lead guitarist plays a solo with his feet. A blind footballer lifts a finger to his lips. Blind footballers score a goal. Back of the net. Yes, I can. A series of people shout, yes, yes, I can, while showing their abilities, including yes, Paralympic swimmer Ellie Simmons, Paralympic sprinter Libby Clegg, a Paralympic shot putter and cyclist, yes, wheelchair multi-Paralympian David yes, Weir, a pilot with no arms, yes, a gymnast with one hand, a graduate with Down syndrome, yes, a ballerina with a prosthetic leg, yes, three Paralympic powerlifters, a deaf signer, and a break dancer. Whew. Did you get all that? Yes, a careers advisor talks to a boy in a wheelchair. No, you can't. Yes, I can! The boy is now a Paralympics GB wheelchair rugby player and crashes into an opponent. A rock climber with one arm missing below the elbow. Martial artist kicking ass. Then heartwarming footage of children using prosthetic limbs at home and at school. The band plays at the top of a mega ramp in a stadium as a man in a wheelchair performs a death-defying stunt and a man with partially formed arms brushes his teeth. The Superhumans, Rio 2016 Paralympics. So, thank you very much. Hopefully, I'll leave you. Yes, you can.